Hello and welcome to a slightly different episode of Talking Shop. On the 22nd of February, three of us from the New Syndicalist editorial team gave a talk at Loughborough University called New Media for a New Workers' Movement. This is the audio from that talk. We talk about how the New Syndicalist project got started and why, what our aims are, how we relate to current syndicalist organising campaigns and what we think the future of syndicalism might look like. It was recorded via lecture capture, so apologies for any wonky sound. So, um, thank you for inviting us to Loughborough. Um, my name's Chris, this is Lydia. Um, we are some of the editorial team. Um, we have a, an editorial team of five, but us three are the people who do the podcast, uh, Talking Shop. So we thought it was probably more appropriate that we come along and talk about the project. Um, so we're going to be talking about a few things today. Um, the idea is we're, we're basically going to talk about how, what the New Syndicalist Project is about, how we operate, what our editorial policy is, and what the principles of the project are. We're then going to talk about, a little bit about uh, syndicalism as a current within the workers' movement and how syndicalism is interacting with contemporary struggles and how we see our media project supporting and aiding those efforts. And then finally, we're going to sort of get our crystal ball and have an attempt to <laughs> kind of speculate about where all this is going. Uh, talk a little bit about syndicalism as a, as a tradition within the British Labour movement. And it's not something that it's not really discuss that often, but there is a syndicalist tradition in the British Labour movement, and speculate a little bit about what, what the way forward is. So um, I'm going to start thank you. Uh, talk a little bit about the project itself, where it came from, what its key ideas are, what inspired us to do this. So uh, there were a number of blogs that were existing around the time that uh, I and many other people in the project were becoming active organisers within a syndicalist union, the Industrial Workers of the World. Um, one particular useful blog was uh, one that was based out in North America, uh, used by American and Canadian uh, union organisers called Recomposition. Uh, Recomposition was a space for reflecting on union strategy, for sharing ideas and experiences, and kind of also talking about people's sort of personal experiences and emotional experiences of work. We thought this was a fairly useful things to engage with. Um, many of us, when we were starting to get sort of do run organising campaigns in the UK, we were using recomposition articles and we were sharing them with each other and saying, you know, look, look at what this person is saying, this is really interesting, this might help you out. We did, however, feel that the left kind of lacked, in the UK lacked that space, so there are plenty of spaces to go for the theoretical um, understandings and analysis and news. But actually, there isn't really a space within the UK left for that kind of critical reflection and organising strategy. So we felt New Cinemas addressed that gap. Um, this feeds into a, a kind of much broader mission statement, which you know, one of the things that we feel that is important to the blog is that we do feel that better educated, reflective organisers play a critical role in building workers' power and shifting the balance of power in our workplaces away from the boss to the shop floor and the workers. So we wanted to very deliberately aid organisers on the ground uh, with that view, with that aim in mind. So, uh, in terms of our philosophy, and this kind of rolls into our editorial policy, there are three things that basically we expect to see in the content that we publish to the blog. Uh, we produce some ourselves, but actually increasingly people come to us as contributors and we try and support them to produce material that we think is going to be helpful. Um, we do feel that these values and practices are actually the same values and practices that uh, working class organisers of the early 20th century used. So actually we're trying to recapture that tradition in many ways. Uh, these are to be practical, to actually give something to organisers that can help them day to day, and help them understand the challenges that they face a little bit better, to be accessible to all workers, uh, and to try and overcome barriers where they do exist, and finally to be transformative, to actually play an active role in changing our society. So, I'll come back. Yeah, fine. <laughs> um, what does it mean to be practical? Well, we aim to directly support um, the work of organisers on the ground, particularly those who are organising in challenging contexts. So a lot of the, our content is about ununionised labour, 
migrant labour, and particularly recently about work in the gig economy. These are areas where there hasn't been a lot of organising work before, um, and actually a lot of people working in these sectors don't really have a voice um, in the workers' movement. So we like to give them that voice and also reflect on the things that we can do to practically support organisation in that area. We do feel that theory and analysis is important, and we feel that the content that is produced for the blog should have a sound analysis that grounds it. We're anti-capitalists, we're materialists, but we feel that it should actually always contain concrete and practical proposals for action. That actually there should be something at the end of every article that says, try this, this is a way forward. Finally, we do have a policy of not engaging in sectarian attacks on other groups. We don't feel that actually on the ground that these are useful things to do. There is a space for political debate, for political disagreement, but the blog is not this. And actually our interest is workers' unity, um, and in that spirit, we tend not to publish content that politically attacks either individuals or groups or organisations. No, we just do that on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, we just do that on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does it mean to be accessible? Well, we tailor our language and our writing style to our intended audience. So, we always think when we're publishing content to the blog, our reader is someone who doesn't have either an informal or formal political education. So we need to break down terminology so everyday, everyday people can understand it, but also this applies just as much to people who are kind of trade union organisers that often they use loads of acronyms, loads of specialist terms, not necessarily academic terms, but terms that require experience within the trade union movement. We would like any worker to be able to read one of our articles and understand what's going on. Um, so we tend to avoid that, and, and actually you'll notice a lot of the podcasts when we invite guests on, the first thing we often do is, is push them to clarify some of the terminology that they're using, um, so it becomes more accessible to our audience. Our pieces are deliberately short, and we tend not to publish lengthy analysis. That is because, sort of as an operating principle, we always consider, could this article be reasonably read on a bus journey to work? Is this something that someone, because we feel that that's how people consume media today, and that's the majority of our working class people consume media, so we need to fit to those expectations. Um, we, we do encourage the idea that you don't need to be an expert or an intellectual or specialist to write for the blog, and actually you have a number of formats that make writing for the blog a little bit easier. We published quite a while ago, actually, early on, a piece about sex work from a sex worker. Um, and it was part of a series called What Does a Union Mean to You? And it's a set number of questions that we, we always ask marginal groups or people who are not normally represented by trade unions to answer. And they said in their feedback that they really appreciated having a format that allowed them to write, that they struggled for years to be able to actually write about their own experiences. And having that set format allowed them to get across their point of view in a way that was a little less daunting than an empty page. So those formats and those series that we use are a way of kind of making writing for the blog more accessible as well as consuming it. Um, and finally, lately we've been doing a lot more audio content. That's because that's an acknowledgement of the changes in the way that people consume media. Podcasts uh, are very popular and we wanted to uh, meet those trends. But also uh, as someone who spends a lot of time in a car driving to and from work or looking after my son, um, actually having audio content allows me to participate in the debates and discussions of the workers' movement in a way that I just wouldn't be able to if I had to sit down and read a journal article or read a book. So it, it's trying to sort of break down and make it as accessible as possible. Uh, and finally, the ultimate aim of all this is to be transformative. We want to equip organising and activists with the capacity to shift the balance of power in their workplaces, and we hope that every article does that in a small way. We hope that actually the content demystifies organising a little bit and emphasises that it's not this kind of superpower, that actually there are very concrete steps that people can take to organise their workplace, and there are challenges and there are barriers, but these are over, sort of, we can overcome them with experience and reflection. Uh, and finally, we do have this broader vision, and our aim is that New Syndicalists, although it started off as a space 
for members of the industrial workers of the world to reflect on what they were doing. We actually have a much broader understanding of our place within the trade union movement now. Um, and we tend to, we've had quite an open dialogue with many different organisers from many different organisations. We spoke to people from RMT, UCU, NEU, Hope Not Hate, recently published an article on our blog, blog as well. And we're hoping that actually that's a way of promoting the idea of syndicalist methods and syndicalist tactics within the wider trade union and growing the influence of those ideas throughout the union. Okay, so Lydia is now going to talk about how this relates to contemporary organising and base unions. Base unions. Cool. Yes, so I'm going to talk about um, current syndicalist organising projects um, and how they relate to the New Syndicalist project. It's going to be a bit London centric because that's where I'm from, so that's what I'm experiencing at the moment. Um, so there's obviously been a kind of a big resurgence of grassroots union organising over the last few years um, that's sort of mainly centred around um, and led by migrant workers um, who are often in kind of precarious forms of work. Um, so in London, that's um, those workers are being organised through several kind of very small unions, uh, so that's IWW, IWGB, UVW and Kairu, and a couple of those are split from the IWW, which is boring. <laughs> um, so the workers that are being organised through those unions are cleaners, security guards, food couriers, private hire, hire drivers, and recently sex workers, um, so among, other, among other groups. Um, so most of these workers are on zero hour contracts or they're working in the gig economy. They're poorly paid and a lot of them have like additional struggles around their status as, as migrants. Um, and they've been considered in some quarters as like unorganisable workers. Um, but these unions have been winning sort of quite significant victories against um, sort of huge companies through a combination of repping and direct action. And it's kind of led to this kind of David and Goliath narrative where you've got these tiny unions going up against a top shop, University of London, fighting Uber in court. Um, I think that a large part of how they've managed to have this kind of outsized influence is how they've used uh, social media. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, so this, their use of social media is kind of meant that these organisations, the companies they're in disputes with, can't dismiss them as insignificant. Um, so they've used social media to sort of mobilise large groups of supporters for pickets and demos. Um, for instance, the kind of the really well-known one was outside Topshop and John Lewis in support of a sapped worker um, who I think we'll see in this video and who was li literally in the last couple of days potentially running a 75 grand settlement, which is amazing. Um, as, as well as kind of living wage demands. These actions are then filmed and circulated on Facebook and Twitter um, and sort of seen by thousands of people, which has the effect of shaming these companies, which is kind of part of their strategy, but also hopefully encouraging other workers to sort of fight back at work. Um, this kind of DIY approach to media is giving a voice to workers who we often talk about, like I'm doing again now, but who we don't hear from directly that often. So the current IWW organising campaign is um, with food careers in the gig economy. So delivery and Uber Eats riders mainly. Um, they're not classified as workers, but instead classified as self-employed under current employment law. Um, that and the fact that they're very they're a kind of atomised workforce, they don't have a fixed place of work, creates quite a challenging organising environment. Um, from my perspective in London, this has kind of led to an ongoing process of um, like evaluating strategies and tactics that are being used um, and then adapting them when we need to. Um, a good example of this came about towards the end of last year. Um, so on November 4th, there was quite an exciting day of strikes and direct action um, for, well, it was, it was focused on Uber Eats, but a lot of delivery riders were involved as well. And so um, it was decided that we would hold a meeting at um, the IWW office in central London with the couriers that we kind of built these links with as we were building for the strike. So a lot of work went into building the meeting, visiting um, couriers outside kind of every McDonald's that we could think of in the city, 
um, and getting sort of trying to nail down some commitments to come. We, we felt like people would agree to come. I think on the day, no couriers showed up. So that could have been a really like, demoralising moment. It could have maybe kind of dissipated all the all of the energy that the branch had sort of built up around this. But I think what the branch did next was really um, it was just really positive. It was people kind of recognised that an attempt to formalise this network that we built up through WhatsApp wasn't really going to work, wasn't the best use of um, our time to branch. So the focus recently has been on um, kind of building more contacts, repping workers who've been kind of, I mean all of these workers are suffering abuses at work, but workers who've been particularly victimised, um, leafleting and more recently um, a monthly newsletter has been developed. Um, so this has led to a a strike earlier, another strike earlier this month. Um, and just before Christmas, there was quite an exciting and raucous occupation of uh, McDonald's. Um, so that's kind of a snapshot of this like very re kind of flexible, quite reactive organising that's happening at the moment in London, but I think also replicated through the careers network across the country and cities where, where careers are organising. So this campaign is definitely not the first attempt at organising careers in the gig economy. Careers have been organising themselves since the inception of platform-based employment. And the problem is that there's little or no institutional memory of, of what those workers did and what worked for them and what didn't work. There's a lot of very immediate sharing of WhatsApp, kind of what's happened, like and sort of trying to adapt things and sort of tactics on the fly, and then a kind of more reflective approach at branch meetings. But New Syndicalist provides a kind of public space for a discussion around strategy and tactics. I don't think it's possible to sort of overemphasize the need to make sort of time and space for this kind of slower work, even in sort of really fast moving campaigns. Um, it's been necessary to react really quickly. Um, workers are making like, very specific demands for action which we need to respond to, but um, I think New Syndicalists can provide a space for the kind of the development of longer term strategies um, and a reflection on kind of what's been working and a place for those uh, tactics to be shared. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Um, so over the last year we've published four pieces related to the campaign, um, a mixture of articles and podcasts. So um, the first one from sort of early last year is a piece called How to Win Against Delivery, which is very practically focused about how you can use delivery's own platform against them um, and how to, sort of, how to build for a strike. Um, in November we interviewed um, an organiser from the IWW Courier Network who talked to us about um, this network, network unionism model and about the international future of uh, gig economy struggles. Um, we interviewed a woman who's working as a courier and as a career organiser in Edinburgh um, during when we were having our Too Many Men series. She talked to one of our editors about organising and, and working in a predominantly male workforce. Uh, and more recently, Andy, who's in our editorial collective, wrote a piece, a really great piece, I thought, about um, the recent Valentine's Day delivery strike, uh, which he was involved in organising. And again, had this real kind of practical focus, um, talking about kind of how the strike was built and sharing like, very concrete advice. But it was also written immediately after the strike had taken place, and so it had this really great excited feeling about it and I felt like reading it like that it was quite an inspiring thing to read. Um, I think that's maybe that kind of more like quite emotional account of organising. There's not an awful lot of space for that on that. So that's quite that's quite pleased that we could uh, that we could share that. Um, as Chris was saying our aim is to stay clear of just like overly academic or theoretical discussions um, in favour of hearing from people who are actually like doing the work, doing the organising. And I think everything that we've published on the Couriers campaign so far has been a kind of first-hand experience from somebody who is a courier, is an organiser, 
and things they've written or spoken to us in a really accessible way. And I mean, I feel like people could read those pieces, listen to those podcasts, and start organising with couriers in their area, kind of based on what they've learned, which is, I think, fundamentally the point of what we want to do with the syndicalist. Um, so that's, I feel like those are the things that we've done well. Obviously, we could improve. Um, one of the things I'd really like to see is um, us giving a platform for more marginalised workers, migrants who are working in the gig economy as their only source of income. Because I think most of the people that have contributed so far have been kind of young white British workers, many of whom have another job or have at least kind of other options. Um, maybe one, one, uh, one way we could, we could do that is uh, more on ground audio based reporting. Because I think at the moment, although the goal would be to have like migrant workers writing for us, I think if we're realistic, we're not reaching those people that we said at the moment. Although that should ultimately be our, what we should be working towards. Which is kind of linked to this idea that I think we could probably do better at publicising ourselves, which it feels a bit uncomfortable, I think, but the project's only useful if people know about it. I mean, I think our readership is levels are pretty good but we could obviously always improve them. Um, and then I think the other, I think the other really important thing we could do is uh, talk about the, kind of the conflicts that come up sometimes around like, race, gender and sexuality when we're organising with workers of different social and political backgrounds. In uh, Andy's piece about um, organising strikes on Valentine's Day, he talks about how like really right-wing views and porn videos sit alongside sort of strategic insights on, on the career WhatsApp groups. Um, just the other day I saw a career outside my work, he had a Bolsonaro sticker on his box, a lot of the workers are Brazilian. Um, so if we, I think sharing sort of thoughtful advice on how we can counter that kind of thing positively um, for people that are unsure of how to react in a constructive way. Um, so Although, yeah, although our focus is on career organising in the IWW, um, other radical unions are doing really exciting, innovative organising in lots of different sectors. So I guess the aim would be to provide a platform for reflections on strategy from UVW sex workers, IWGBs, private hire drivers, and high roofs cleaners as well. Yeah. So basically on this one, I drew the short straw, so uh, I, <laughs> I have to do the crystal ball gazing bit. Um, but before I do that, I want to sort of spend a bit of time talking about what the past of syndicalism in the UK really is. Um, the British tradition of syndicalism is very much based in the existing tradition of trade unionism. Um, it never developed on its own, as it did in, in Spain or in the US. Um, it was more based around an organisation called the Industrial Syndicalist Education League, um, which was actually very influential in the uh, refocus of the trade union movement, the movement away from uh, craft unionism towards trade unionism, um, really influential people like Tom Mann, um, who actually was involved in the precursors to the Labour Party. Um, and I think its reach really was emphasised by its, even its first conference had a reach of about 600,000 members. So that was the delegates representing about 600,000 members. Um, it never aimed to become a union. It was there as an education league. It was there to educate the trade union movement around the values of syndicalism, around the ideas of syndicalism. Um, and actually, I think arguably, it was, a, it was extremely successful at doing that. Those ideas of syndicalism run very much through the trade union movement right up until the 1970s. Very clear in the ways that the trade union movement organised, the strength of the trade union movement in the UK is very much married with the, those ideas of syndicalism, that kind of member-led, um, shop steward, all of those things, of those workplace committees, all those things are syndicalist ideas, um, which have kind of been embedded in the trade union movement from its from its earliest stage, really. Um, however, that large membership of the tr of mainstream trade unions and of uh, social democratic parties, obviously with Labour being the largest 
Social Democratic Party in the world. That's right, isn't it? I'm not making that up. I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it confidently and we'll say that it's true. <laughs> um, means that there hasn't been that body that's, that's, that's got started here in the UK. Uh, obviously, more recently, you have seen the birth of um, the IWW, uh, well, re emergence of the IWW in the UK. Um, but even then, uh, we're talking small scale. I mean, that uh, concentration of syndicalist power has never happened here. There's never been an industry that's been dominated by syndicalism uh, or, or any particular area of the country where syndicalism has really had a real strength. Unlike in the US, where you've had really strongholds for the IWW, uh, workplaces where the IWW has a long history, CNT in Spain, same there, where you've had industries dominated by the CNT. Um, that's never happened yet and still doesn't exist today. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of media coverage of the uh, base unions and syndicalist unions' involvement in the service sector and in the couriers, in courier industry. However, even then, we're talking real small scale. You know, as far as the overall picture of the number of people employed in those industries, we talk, we're still talking really small scale. Um, there is no history of that tradition, uh, of that independent tradition, and I think that's, that's where it keeps coming back to. The minuscule scale also plays out outside of the membership as well in things like staffing. There isn't any, there isn't any of these organisations that have a real strong grounded like a number of staff, an established organisation um, that you have in other syndicalist organisations like in Sweden, for example, you've got a really established organisation with a huge history. That just doesn't happen here. Um, and, and obviously there's a little bit too scope. Um, however, that's not to say that there isn't, there isn't positives to be said about the impact syndicalism is, is having. Um, it, is, it is clearly from, from the amount of coverage that it's getting pushed and with its weight. You know, it is, it is having influence on industry, it's having uh, influence on decisions that companies are making, um, but it's having an influence on the wider trade union movement. That's really, that's crystal clear from how, uh, from, for example, the Baker's Union's McDonald's campaign is, is and, you know, it's following wholeheartedly IWW's fast food campaigns. You know, it's took ideas from the Starbucks campaigns, it's took ideas from our pizza Up campaign, and the organise, you know, and that's not something they hide either, that's not something that they're ashamed to say. Um, I've had conversations with the head of organising Baker's Union, and he specifically refers to IWW campaigns when he's talking about the plans that they use. You know, that they, they, will, they are looking at campaigns that syndicalist unions do, base unions do, and they're thinking, how can we copy those? Um, that media coverage is, as Lydia said, it's been absolutely essential there. But the victories as well, you know, those big wins, big wins that mainstream trade unions look at and are jealous of. You know, the fact that um, in 2011 we got a national level pay rise for peace up, you know, that, that's something that, that still is relatively unheard of. Um, and that ability to organise in those places where other trade unions just can't get into. Um, and I think that is a lot to do with the tactics, a lot to do with the fact that we look more like um, the people working in those industries. Um, our membership in the syndicalist movement is something that the trade union movement is 100% jealous of. You know, you just you look at the age, the activism, the diversity in the syndicalist movement. Not perfect, very stretched the imagination, there's still huge issues with it but it is a million miles away from what the mainstream trade union movement has. The mainstream trade union movement, just for example, 1% of, of trade union activists and TUC unions are not white. 1%. And that, that, that just, that, that, that is blown away by, when you look at campaigns like the Cleaners campaigns in uh, the, um, uh, the, the base unions in London you know, it's completely different, completely different. Um, so my mum's question. So now we, <laughs> I speak really quick. Um, now we'd be interested in asking, answering questions. I've maybe got two related ones. Um, 
just with the publicity for the magazine, I, yeah. and, and well, less the publicity than talking, mm -hmm. getting the voices of these marginalized workers, I just wonder if asking them to write in Spanish or Portuguese, maybe. Just because uh, mm -hmm. I know a lot of the UW and mm -hmm. so I know they have language classes and that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We used to do that. But the other question was what you guys are doing seems to sound a lot like labor notes in the States. And I wonder if there's any ties there, or if you guys have learned anything from them, or maybe learned to not do things from them. Like that. Just because they seem to have a good, because it's based around that annual conference where they get a lot of people, and it really encourages like sort of that grassroots writing, that kind of thing. Just on that, on that second one first, I, yeah. I think and we do get a lot of ideas from them because you know it, it's it's great they're so connected into the trade union movement and something we're trying to. Develop and, and part of that has been bringing in speakers from a range of unions and building those connections with a range of unions. But one thing we've really been keen to steer away from has been uh, sort of news journalism. We're not we're not looking to report on when strikes are happening and where they're happening. It's more like as Lydia said, I think that it's like a slow journalism. That idea of slow journalism that like those people talk about at the minute. You know, it's it's about. It's not about things that are happening now, it's about thinking about two weeks later, a month later, about that thing that happened. Um, and I know, I'm just really up on there, but like one thing that one phrase that I always took around when we we're having these discussions is the idea of being the economist for the radical trade union movement. The Economist is a great magazine, you know, it does fantastic journalism, great discussion, disagree with almost everything that they say, right? But ultimately, it's good journalism. So there's nothing wrong with looking at that and going, why don't we have something like that? Why don't we have an idea similar to that? So, yeah, I think there's loads of ideas to be learned from from people like Labour Notes, from people like them. But it, we're trying to do something a bit different. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, we'd, we'd love to develop more multilingual resources. We're often beholden to the time and energy that people yeah. volunteer. But it's certainly something that we've... Um, there's actually a number of uh, our articles which they're not very helpful for the organising happening in London. They're in German language because there's a partner project in Germany called New Debate who like our content have translated it. So yes, yeah, certainly that's an area that we'd like to expand and develop. Um, it would be nice to have multilingual versions of, of most of the key content we produce. Again, driven by that accessibility. So if anyone's organising German language speaking. <laughs> we're like so we, we sued for like America in like the late 1800s. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like German immigrants. Yeah, and, yeah then, then we're the place to go. <laughs> I guess I um I, I kind of wondered I guess kind of two things mm -hmm. like whether you think like the you know, the class composition right, that is brought down mm -hmm. from precarious employment whether that plays in directly to some of those principles. Um, and has there been any attempt from all mainstream unions to kind of co-opt or absorb these initiatives in any way? Well, we, when we spoke to Chris, who was the career organiser in Scotland, he mentioned that the trade unions had attempted to imitate some of the career organising they were doing but generally done quite a poor job. Um, I think there's probably a variety of reasons of that. I think certainly a TUC union has a great deal more resources and a great deal more funds and also full-time organisers that a syndicalist union won't have. But they often don't have the mindset um, that a syndicalist organiser will have they also have servicing commitments that often actually take them away from organising and actually those servicing commitments are often a priority in the organisation or at least a legal, legal obligation that they have to fulfil. Um, I kind of feel that, well certainly like my path to organising had many, many, many crushing defeats <laughs> on the way and I think uh, people who grow up in base unions have a much more resilient mindset mm -hmm. when it comes to organising. Um, they are much more thinking about teeny tiny little victories in order to build collective strength. And and I think um, I don't I don't want to kind of 
do too much disfavour to people who organise in TUC unions, but I think often the idea is you'll have a time scale, you'll have a budget, you've got to throw everything at it, and then you kind of, if it's not working, you'll move on. And I think there's a certain resilience to um, people who are working within IWW, IGW, UW, who are going to stick at it um, and really, really fight hard. Um, I think we also have a flexibility as well that is difficult to replicate in a much larger organisation. You know, in a in a sort of small branch meeting without having to like sort of sign off with anybody else, we can decide, okay, that didn't work, should we just do a newsletter? Let's see whether that works. I think being small has its drawbacks, but I think it also enables that kind of flexibility, which has been really important in these gig economy struggles. Yeah, this is well the fact that we can like we can continue. We spend the first the first portion of organising this it base most of the base unions operate on this is the big first portion of your organising you do without any membership anyway. You know, you, the couriers network, for example, the vast proportion of that work is done without any membership. Most of those people are not a member of the IWW or IWGB. That comes much further down the line. Yeah. You get people to join because they've already seen what the union is capable of. That's not a model that most trade unions would be willing to sign up to. You know, they're very, very beholden to the idea that you join up and you don't get anything until you've joined up. Now, obviously, that's not universally the case, and there's a lot of organising that goes on on the fringes that that's different. But the the main steer is you get people to join up, then we do something about it. Not not we do something about it and it encourages people to join by the fact that we've done those things it's, it's got to be membership first and i think and i think that's one thing that that needs to be a lesson that a lot of trade unions need to learn is that it isn't it, it membership isn't the be all and end all yeah we want people to join but actually the be all and end all is that we that people have working class people have confidence to be able to stand up for themselves and actually, once they've seen once they've seen how we do things, then they'll they'll join anyway. You know, and it, it, it's it's just a different way of looking at things. And I think that that plays into the the first part of the question as well about the changing class composition. There isn't there isn't that base that just exists that just naturally exists. Massive workplaces, etc. You know, they they still exist. There's still those massive workplaces, but there isn't those that 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 working class community that you can just rely on for continuity. You know, it's yeah. Yeah, there isn't there there isn't that there isn't that community based memory of trade union activism anymore. You know, it's part of what we try and do is 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 create somewhere where things can be remembered and ideas can be remembered. Um, but there isn't that memory that just automatically passes on to people that you need to be a trade union member. That isn't something that people just pick up innately. Um, you know, we have to start from scratch with people, and actually, confidence is where it starts, way before anything else. Uh, and that is, yeah, and it plays exactly into that. That things have just changed. You can't, you can't organise it around the idea that people just understand you when you say you should be a member of a union, because I don't even know what your union is. The best response that I've got was, you know, give me the students' union. You know, so you do get, you do people just don't understand that. I think the 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 the, the other point to make is that. <coughs> There is a national context that actually changes from country to country in terms of what base unions are doing and we have to swim within the legal framework that exists in this country. The UK has very restrictive trade union laws and particularly the, the quite tough restrictions on increasingly now uh, balloting for industrial action but also just even getting recognition agreements makes organising in this country well, if you want to have, we basically, if we want to have the collective strength to actually fight, we almost have to bypass those restrictions. In other, in other countries, that's not the case. So in the US, you can petition for recognition in a single workplace and you don't have to wrangle about collective bargaining unions like you do in the UK. You can organize in a single shop. And that's what, you know, our, our sister unions in the IWW does, you know, it gets recognition agreements. Um, on a single shop basis in Belgium there. Um, I went out to Poland to the Workers' Initiative Conference, which is another syndicalist union based out there. And they actually have a very, quite surprisingly for Poland actually, given the political climate, but quite an open, maybe a legacy of things like solidarity, I don't know, but quite open 
legal framework for trade unions, it's actually possible to operate as a trade union very easily um, with very, very very few legal restrictions. So that means who are they, who are they organising? Well, they're organising um, crane operators, you know, nursery workers, um, teachers. You know, all these kind of areas that we would probably you know have to be dealing with the TUC recognised union in those workplaces. They're taking those for the first time. So I think if all of these base unions are trying to find the best way of building collective strength within the legal restrictions that exist in their national context. And for us, you know, career organizing seems to be working and we, we kind of go with what works. That's part of the mindset, isn't it? Yeah. That's where the legal status is, that it's not as work as it's often thought. It actually works to their advantage and our advantage in that they can go on strike, which like very easily, they're just decided to do it, and you know, there's no, you know, yeah. we're not going to get any comeback as a union for organising it because they're self employed, so it's legal. Yeah. They're it's just like, choosing not to go to work, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just on a, sort of an extension of what maybe I was doing when you were sitting, mm -hmm. do you get, and this is probably like an unreasonable demand <laughs> or something, but just in the sense of is there much sort of international reporting? Obviously, we're not reporting in the sense of just saying this strike has happened, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But in terms of adapting, saying what the, your American branches are doing, or maybe what the German, I mean, did you, are, you re, are you translating some of their stuff into English? Yes, we, we, that, it? we've, had, we've had contributions from all over the world. Well, predominantly the US and Germany. But we have, we have, we have, we have, had, we have had contributions in Europe as well. Eastern Europe, yeah. So we do we do have a, a varied input. As far as making sure we're getting a wider reach, that's a bit difficult. Obviously, being that we're all based in the UK and uh, you know our networks that we connect with are all in the UK predominantly. But we do try and break out of that as much as possible because actually a lot of those really good ideas come from come from all over the place. And it, to be honest, our approach is is you know as Chris laid out, it's as long as it's practical has you know. And is accessible. It doesn't, you know. We are we are pretty open to where those contributions are coming from. Um, they don't need to come from syndicates either. You know, like they, they can come from anyone who is making a valued contribution to what um, what union activists need to hear. You know, depending on what that's about. You know, we're quite open to that. Um, and I think that comes into ideas of. That plays into our editorial stance, but also what syndicalism is. It syndicalism is supposed to be quite open. You know, it's a, it's a tactic, rather. You know, as well as a political ideology, it's a tactic, right? So having that open approach to to ideas has to absolutely feed into that. Not just where those people come from, but where they're coming from politically as well. You know, you and uh, and I think that's why we get some real interesting contributions from people. Actually, I have something that's kind of related to that, too, about like the kind of sectarianism. And uh, I was just kind of wondering about like our generation, that we, kind of, we didn't come of age, you know, with the kind of battle of the ideologies, you know, the liberal world and what have you. I was just wondering uh, if, you know, interacting with these, these people, you know, they, they don't seem to be preloaded with revolutionary theory and like blah, 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 but it helps uh, like this kind of generation redefining what it means to be a radical or a plural from the ideological dynamic. Yeah, if that's something you've noticed. Or... I think um, with the career organising, it's interesting because we, so this, I mentioned about the Bolsonaro thing, and this is something that organisers in North London have picked up on as well, but there are these Brazilian workers who are like absolutely up for just taking like really, um, you know, taking direct action, and they're like, really like seriously radical about the organising they're doing but have this like seemingly like really contradictory um, opinion about um, well you know like basically supporting a, a fascist um, and that's I mean it, when we talked about this in the London branch we've kind of this idea that you were talking about the kind of the day was talking about this kind of this show don't tell approach to being in, to sort of explaining what a union is just kind of just doing it <laughs> and um, people kind of, you know, getting on, people on board with us that way. I think we've, the hope for us is that kind of through like seeing solidarity in action and like building bonds with people to the point where you can sort of start to challenge some of those kinds of ideas. 
seems like the best way forward to kind of rather than kind of taking people to task like immediately but just like you know showing them the alternative and then in being able to have these really frank discussions because you've got a really strong and really strong connection yeah i think one of one of there's a recomposition article um that i continue to refer back to all the time um, called See the, Hear, See the Union, Hear the Union, Know the Union. I uh, re recommend reading it, it's really, it's really good. And it talks about mindset and people's kind of politics and what, what you find in a workplace um, and what you find in a community. And there will be a minority of people who, who know the union, who are already on side, who have that, you know, like you're saying, that priming in sort of anti-capitalist or revolutionary politics or left-wing politics. But they will be a minority. Um, so they, you don't need to worry about them because they're already on side and you know when it comes to it they're going to be backing you. Then um, there are some people who need to hear the union okay and that's kind of still a minority but another big chunk and they're the people who need to kind of know that there's victories going on, know that it's working, know that it's functional, know, it's, know that it's competent and responsible and they'll be on side once they see it's credible and then actually the vast majority of people need to see the union, they need to see the union in action and they actually need to see things being won, and you see people acting in solidarity, like you say, like actually feel solidarity. Um, and I think that that article was intended just to, as a kind of analysis of a workplace, but I think it applies just as equally to wider society, that actually organising is an educational process, and part of the mission of the blog is to equip organisers to bring that process to people, and hopefully therefore bring them towards the politics and the ideas that we want them to and hopefully shed away <laughs> some unhelpful <laughs> politics and ideas that they come to us with. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah. I think, I think that's, that's like, it's, um, it's a sliding scale as well because actually one of the things that, that's always attracted me to syndicalism as an approach and one of the reasons I'm so passionate about what we do is, is because of its pluralistic approach. Syndicalism <coughs> has always had a really wide input as far as activists it always has you know throughout its entire history as an idea it's had it's had you know a full range from anarchists to people pushing for parliamentary or presidential victory you know it's 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 it, it has always had a wide range of people you know I, I'm, I'm i myself am a labor party member and a syndicalist and i don't see those things as contradictory you know i i see syndicalism as a fantastic way to build class strength and to build the power of the working class but also I have no issue with being a Labour Party member you know I don't, I don't and, and I think that's that's one of the reasons why um, it, it so set, successfully brings people together because it fits into that idea as you quite rightly said you know, people who have been who look at these arguments over needlessly nitty-gritty arguments over ideology and just go I don't have anything to do with that and instantly walk away, um, and we we try and avoid that. Although you know, I don't like making jokes about sectarianism and making jokes about other organisations, but mainly because it's funny. We're having our actually here. Thank you for listening to Talk and Shop, a podcast by New Syndicalist for trade union activists and organisers. If you'd like to listen to previous episodes or review our other content, please check out our website, newsyndicalist.org. You can also keep updated on future episodes by subscribing to our podcast via Acast, iTunes or Stitcher. While you're there, why not leave us a review to help us find more people like yourself? If you have a suggestion for future content, would like to submit your own ideas, or would like to discuss any of the ideas raised in this or previous episodes, please contact us at newsyndicalist at gmail.com. Thanks again. Bye.